The Nordics are perceived as global frontrunners towards carbon neutrality. But what is just green transition? Why addressing it is crucial. What kind of impact do we see at local and regional levels? And what are the necessary tools and policies that lead towards just green transition? Join the discussion with speakers and experts from all the Nordic countries. Welcome to Nordregio Forum 2021, Session 2, How to Lead the Green Transition. Nordregio Forum Session 2, 2021, about leadership for just green transition. So Nordregio Forum is the Nordic meeting place for all of you working with regional and local development in the Nordic countries. And we have some 250 signups today, so we hope many of you are following us live. But of course, the event will also be recorded. And we're trying a truly hybrid event today. So we have a wonderful live audience here with the, uh, members from some of our Nordic thematic groups on regional development as well, who are here and have had their own meetings as well. So we're just really delighted. Um, to have everyone here. Um, my name is Åsa Ström Hildestrand and I'm Head of Communications at Norregio and I will host the event today together with my dear colleague. Pipsa Salami, warmly welcome also from my behalf. Yes, and today's theme, leadership for just green transition. So why is this so important? Well, to make progress towards our COP commitments. So, as you probably all aware, the Nordic countries are perceived as global frontrunners towards carbon neutrality. But what kind of impact do we see at regional and local levels? How do we solve conflicting interests, address the social and economic aspects, our huge consumption footprint, and the urban-rural divide? Well, there is lots of opportunity for cross-Nordic learning here. And we are really excited to, to present our speakers for today and also hear from you. So please join the discussion during uh, the, the session here uh, in the chat on YouTube. If you just log in using your Google account or just sign in otherwise, and also here in the room. So Pipsa, what about the program? Yes, we have a very exciting afternoon today. Uh, first, you will get to meet our researchers, uh, then followed by a few keynotes about green leadership. And then we will take you on a Nordic tour. And like Osa mentioned, we really warmly welcome you to join the chat. And please uh, also ask questions here in the live audience. There will be a session for questions, so uh, we will pick as many as we can. So, uh, let's get started. Uh, first, we will hear some opening words from Paula Lehtomäki, Secretary General at the Nordic Council of Ministers. Dear Nordic friends, two weeks ago I visited the COP26 in Glasgow. It has been a decade since my last participation and the difference could really be felt. Ten years ago, some still had doubts whether climate change is caused by humans and we were still discussing if we should even react. Now, we tighten our commitments and recognize the urgent need for action. As we today discuss green leadership, it is important to look at the coming decade. It is, important, it, it is impossible to foresee the future but it is clear what we need to do in any case. We are on the threshold of a thorough green transition of our societies, a road we need to take both at home and globally. It will bring about profound changes in many areas of life and calls for changes at a systemic level. Some of them are easier than others, some can be even painful but they are necessary and will bring better life quality than otherwise would be the case. Politicians tend to say that everyone knows what needs to be done, but no one knows how to win elections by doing so. Green leadership is about taking that risk, recognizing the direction 
and having the courage to lead the way towards it. The Nordic Prime Ministers paved the way for Nordic cooperation when they, in August 2019, adapted a vision for, of the Nordic region to become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world by 2030. All work within Nordic Council of Ministers is now directed to fulfilling this vision. Sustainable and integrated. The Nordic region has many strengths in going this way and achieving this ambition. But we have challenges as well. Consumption-based emissions is an area which we seldom talk about and seldom count in in our climate targets. And yet, we have one of the largest material footprints in the world. We have a chance to change this. Reports tell us that by taking circularity actions we can reduce our emissions from imported materials and products by 20 to 30 million tonnes of CO2 per year by 2050. That is even more than the potential of our own territorial emissions, which can be reduced by 10 to 20 million tonnes through circularity actions. But it requires that we face the facts to achieve the real sustainability. Courage to see the facts as they are is an important part of green leadership as well. Ladies and gentlemen, today we focus on concrete actions at the regional and local level. This is a big focus area for us at the Nordic Council of Ministers. There are many municipalities, cities and regions taking important steps to a greener future. For example, by calculating their carbon footprints and integrating sustainability into their planning and budgeting. Today we will hear more about the local level work and its challenges, but also how to support the local level in their work. I am delighted that today we have an opportunity to learn more about concrete activities that are ongoing in the Finnish city of Lahti. Lahti is an industrial town that became the EU Green Capital 2021. Lahti already reutilized 97% of municipal waste and is aiming to become fully circular by 2050. A truly inspiring story and I know you will hear more this afternoon. To tackle the challenges of a green transition calls for global commitment and national and international policy decisions. But the concrete actions must be taken by us all. In regions, in cities, in companies, in organisations and on individual level. Therefore, it is important we get together, learn from each other, learn from what succeeded but also what failed. I wish you all inspirational discussions today and encourage you all to keep up the good work in our efforts for a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, for that greeting. Uh, so the Nordic Council Ministers are obviously running several projects and initiatives now to, to help us all collaborate on this. Uh, big task. And I think she also said it very well here that politicians tend to say that everyone knows what needs to be done, but no one knows how to win elections by doing so. Um, that green le leadership is about taking this risk to recognize the direction and have the courage to lead the way towards it. I think we'll try and keep that in mind. And I'm also super happy that we have the mayor of Lahti the EU Green City here today, so we'll hear more about his leadership and courage to lead. But before that, I would love to uh, engage and invite my own colleagues on stage, senior research fellows Anna Karlsdottir and Anna Lundgren, because uh, Norregio also works with several projects right now on just uh, green transition and also with a special fo focus on rural regions. So, very welcome um, to join us here at Forum. Yes, please use the hand mics and you can just switch it on. Yes, that looks good. So, uh, maybe first of all, why is just green transition important? Anna, perhaps you want to start. I can start. I, I think 
the green transition, first of all, that is a, that is a necessity that we, we understand. But in order to be successful in, in achieving the green transition, we also need to take into account the economic perspectives and the social perspectives. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're also aiming at in some of our Nordrego projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so basically to, to take into account several perspectives and the, the green transition is a systemic change. We have been discussing that this morning uh, also. Uh, where we need to take in different aspects and also these concepts are very, very complicated. Uh, if we talk about justice, if we talk about green and we talk about transi transition, mm. all these concepts are very complicated. Certainly, and Anna Karlsdottir, I know that uh, your project, you're also leading uh, or co-chairing the Nordic Thematic Group on Rural uh, Development. Um, you have a project that focuses specifically on the rural regions when yeah. it comes to the green transition. So maybe you could add a little bit to what Anna said here about yeah, the yes. rural dimension. Um, our project is called uh, Just Green Transition in Rural Areas, Local Benefits from Value Creation, which um, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, you, you hear in what direction it's headed, it's value creation, it's a local uh, benefits uh, from uh, these uh, very fastly ongoing transitions that we see around in rural areas and the Nordic uh, Corporation already has acknowledged as uh, uh, really should be a focus area in Nordic Corporation because uh, Overall, we see that uh, rural areas will probably be more deeply uh, implicated by this uh, uh, transitions, and uh, this is not least due to that uh, to available land in rural mm. areas. So we see a lot of installations ongoing, and some of them have less local benefit than others. Mm -hmm. So we want to project our focus uh, to land use planning that uh, in this very fast. Uh, uh, shift mm -hmm. are not really applicable to the conditions that uh, so so this is some kind of a policy uh, research focus that we are having we mm -hmm. want to enhance the benefits f for local population so that's the goal and you will do yeah. some case studies then i assume and look deeper yes into we will look into energy transitions mm -hmm. and the job generation of uh, out of uh, some of these transitions in selected areas mm -hmm. Uh, but um, an in example in, in relation to windmills uh, that are windmill installations and developments are going on in all of the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see a landscape, interesting landscape evolve where there are uh, quite huge risks of amplifying conflicts. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to stress that uh, in our Nordic cooperation, we have a commitment to try to um, identify perspectives that actually increase cohesiveness rather than, uh, than increasing conflict. So mm -hmm. this is also part of our aim. And Anna, I know that in your project, you're also looking at different vulnerable groups when it comes to just green transition. I don't know, maybe you could build on, on this. Do you also see this conflicts emerging or conflicting interests or what is your approach? That, that is true in, in our project. We will focus on the social impacts of the green transition and we will be focusing on on different kinds of groups. We will focus on, on unemployed and those that risk unemployment due to the green transition, but also other vulnerable groups that have been pinpointed by the Nordic Council of Ministers, and that is children, elderly people, and those uh, that are disabled that we will look into. Mm. Uh, and of course, the, the social impacts of the green transition is also related to the economic impacts mm. uh, very closely. So how are different groups impacted uh, by this transition economically and socially mm -hmm. and how does this look spatially are uh, the differences between urban areas and rural areas and different parts of our countries that is also issues that we will look into do you also look then into what what uh, policies will will emerge in terms of compensating the vulnerable groups 
You, you're right. Uh, that is also an aim of the project, is to build knowledge and mm. to share knowledge on these mm. topics. But it is also to identify policies. How can, uh, um, how can policies be framed and formulated in order to not accentuate the vulnerability of those groups that I already mentioned? Mm. Uh, so that is the name of the project. And I know you're also uh, aiming to do a, a survey or build on existing surveys to find out more. What, what do the Nordic people think of the green transition? Are we welcoming it or is it a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, yeah, challenges in just implementing things? Well, that, that is part of it. Uh, that, uh, that was also mentioned here by Paula Lehtomäti that, that everyone has to be involved in this green transition at all, all levels of government and at all levels are in society. So to understand how different groups perceive the green transition mm -hmm. uh, is also important and uh, that is something that we will do in our studies in this project. It's mm -hmm. a four-year project and we're starting now basically, mm, yeah. this autumn. So yeah, we should say that. Uh, if it sounds like she doesn't have too many results, it's because there are no correct. results yet. You're just, you just started this fall. Um, Anna, maybe you could just also add, uh, when it comes to, to the value creation and, and the positive impacts of the green transition, do you have any, anything already that you uh, foresee that you will look into here, or do you know of, of any of, of the regions you're looking at, how they've benefited so far? or made the most of the green transition? I think for on the positive side, we'll, we, we are already seeing reorientation and in innovative activities around and mm -hmm. entrepreneurship that's directed in another way uh, than earlier. And, uh, and I'm expecting that this will bring us a fruitful and more sustainable uh, 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 prosperity, b but uh, I, th I also think that uh, in our work it's very important to uh, examine and explore how we can rurally prove um, this green transition to enable the situation not to be too polarized. Mm -hmm. Because as both Paula Letomati Letomaki said, and many others have stressed, it's a very complex issue. It, uh, it uh, needs courage to take the steps ahead. And for instance, I want to highlight the, the Greenland the government's very courageous decision not to explore oil and, uh, and not to mine uh, with... Uh, yeah. Uh, impacts of radiation and uh, uranium byproduct. And this actually has a spatial implication for the rural areas of southern Greenland because it means that the business development in future to come will be di directed in another direction than it would have been if they had taken another decision. They will go green instead of fossil, yes. which is, uh, yeah, definitely courageous, I would say. Uh, any final comments on your expectations on the day or on the afternoon discussions here? I, I very much look forward to hearing ma more about those complexities. I mean, there are so many perspectives that need to be taken into account. Uh, we talk about the green, we talk about the economic, we talk about the social, we talk about the distributional effects, the spatial effects. Uh, when, when we talk about the, the concept of justice mm. itself uh, in, in the COP um, context, we mm. often talk about the future generations and we talk about the effects uh, outside of the Nordics, outside mm. of the countries. Mm. Uh, so there, there are so many angles and to it and how that is taken care of mm. and how that can be addressed. I think that is very important when we talk about leadership for the future. Definitely. Anna? Final word. <laughs> yeah. I'm just Your looking so much forward to hear these various uh, presentations today because I think they will uh, make us recognize even more this very complicated but broad societal issues that are related to gr green leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna and Anna. <laughs> and I'll leave the floor to you, Pipsa. are all looking forward to now we get to touch upon the keynote uh, presentations. Uh, Lahti has already been mentioned a few times now today so it feels like uh, it doesn't need any more uh, 
any more introductions, but how we are so excited to hear how did a mid-sized industrial town, Lahti, become the green leader in the EU when it comes to uh, city development. So, uh, Mayor of Lahti, Pekka Timonen, please, the floor is yours. And we start with a short video first. Ajatella, että tähän laskettiin vuosikymmeniä kaikki Lahden jätevedet ja myös teollisuuden litkut. 60-luvulla järvi oli niin huonossa kunnossa, että koko enon selkä muuttui vihreäksi. Sinilevää oli talvellakin ja vesi haisi kamalta. Näillä vain ongelmaa yritettiin ratkaista lisäämällä veteen happea, mutta laihoin tuloksin. Onneksi 80-luvulla järveä alettiin tutkia tosissaan. Samalla ymmärrettiin, että siitä huolehtiminen onkin paljon isompi homma. Rehevöitymisen estämiseksi on kalastettu 5 miljoonaa kiloa särkeä, kuoretta ja lahnaa. Siis 3000 tällaista veneellistä täynnä kalaa. luvulla EU-rahoitus loppui ja sinilevä valtasi taas järven. Mietittiin, että saadaanko tästä puhdasta ikinä. Onneksi päätettiin perustaa vesijärvisäätiö. Siihen saatiin mukaan kaikki järven tulevaisuudesta kiinnostuneet tahot. Järven kunnossapito ei voi olla projektiluontoista. Sen pitää olla jatkuvaa ja määrätietoista hommaa. Työ jatkuu yhä. Mutta projekti on jo nyt oppikirja esimerkki vesien hoidosta. Mutta me tähdätään siihen, että vuonna 2100 järven tila on entistä parempi. Tästä syystä Lahti on Euroopan ympäristöpääkaupunki 2021. So good afternoon everyone and uh, so happy that you were inspired by our inv environmental director and other our water management people putting themselves putting their really into it a uh, very concrete way. Uh, this year Lahti is the European Green, Green Capital as already mentioned but also mentioned that is also a, a, a great uh, uh, change story. It's about city that has been able to change itself and it's, it's pushing forward a positive change. And uh, as said already, 30 years ago, that lake was the most polluted lake in Finland and probably the most polluted lake in, in Nordic countries. Today it's clean and it's, as you can see, we can swim and enjoy the water. And that was actually a very big starting point on what has happened in Lahti since that. We haven't looked back after that. So. So, first of all, uh, uh, the, the uh, Lahti as the European Green Capital. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of the Green Capital, but Lahti is now the, the uh, third city in the Nordic countries, uh, fourth city to become the, the European Green Capital. Stockholm was the first uh, already 11 years ago, and since that Copenhagen and Oslo have been the European Green Capital. Uh, Lahti now here in Finland is the first European Green Capital uh, uh, from Finland. Uh, you become the European Green Capital by a competition. It's a very tough competition. Several cities, over 60 cities this autumn were competing to become the European Green Capital. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's two different expert panels who then select the city. And as you can see there from the screen, there are 12 different categories where you are measured and evaluated. So, uh, so these environmental indicators are behind the expert panels and then you have to convince the panel that you are the best city to be chosen. So Lahti is also this year, as I said, the, the, ex the, the example of the Brussels have chosen to show the European leadership and, and, and the European capacities. We are also the smallest European green capital ever, 120,000 people one hour from our capital Helsinki, 200,000 people as an urban region. Uh, you don't have to look what's inside those balls, but the story is the most important thing. 
Lahti's journey to be the European green capital and now one of the global leaders as environmental sustainable cities and city development is a long story. So behind this story is a very long-term commitment to very ambitious environmental targets. And that's, I would say, is the key for all the cities. Uh, uh, you, the most important thing is that you start doing. We haven't put so much effort on on, on very glancy advertorials, not so much effort on, on giving big declarations, but putting a lot of effort on doing things, making things happen, doing the change. So uh, this, we were being the world's first or Finland's first in several different things related to sustainable urban development and environmental policies. So. Our city hasn't been the most resourceful. We are, are not the most educated. We are a typical brownfield city, I would say, an industry that has developed or dis even disappeared. And even then we have been able to go forward and even go forward faster than many other cities. So our message is very simple. If we have been able to do this, all cities can. And we are also a very typical European cities. Most Europeans live in mid-sized cities like Lahti, uh, from 100 to 300,000 people. So we also represent the majority of the Uber, European urban life and, and cities. So anyway, long journey. Our climate targets and climate program was already adopted by the City Council in 2009 with very ambitious goals for uh, emission reductions and, and adaptation for the climate change. So already 12 years ago, our city decided to have a very ambitious climate program. And again, you start early, you get far. Quite simple. And here are some of the results we already have been able to reach. On, on the top corner, you can see how our CO2 emissions have been have been cut, so we have already cut 70% of our EU2 CO2 emissions. Very significant cut in that. And, and, and we are very proud of that, but we have still have to move forward. And some words about that a bit later. We also have been able to cut our energy consumption uh, in city activities, but also in the city as a whole. You can see we have said goodbye to coal. We still had coal as a major um, source for heat. Uh, but 2018, we closed uh, uh, the power plant using the, uh, the coal and said goodbye to fossil fuels in, in our energy systems and district heating systems. We also utilize very effective, effectively all sources of, of sustainable energy. And then we are utilizing our municipal waste so that in 2007, we still needed a landfill. 55% of our waste were go, was going to the landfill. Today, we are even better than, than uh, Paul Lehtomäki just said. We are actually utilizing 99% of our municipal waste. And we don't have a landfill anymore. So we said goodbye to landfills. We said goodbye to coal. We said goodbye to landfills. So, so re recycling or reusing our municipal waste is also on, already on a, on a high level. And then look at the other things. We have now the goal. We have, to, we have a big target on traffic, so urban mobility. So we, our target, as is more than half of our urban mobility by 2030, is sustainable. Air quality have improved, water quality have improved, and area, the, uh, the conservation areas in the city limits have been uh, expanded. Today, in Helsinki, Helsinki Sanoma, Sanomat, Finland's main newspaper, there was a big article about when Lahti is uh, the first city in Finland to start ecological compensation. So when we build something on a city area, we compensate that lost biodiversity in other parts of the city. So first city again in some, doing something. We were also the first city in the world to try a personal carbon trade where, where citizens were... were uh, had a possibility to use their mobile phones in order to, to calculate their carbon footprint. And when they were cutting it down, they got theater tickets, um, uh, bus tickets, etc. And also when we, inv uh, when we um, 
uh, interviewed them. They said also a pint of beer would be would be great, <laughs> but we are still working on that. Having the we are the home of the Finland's largest brewery, so that's quite natural. But we are still working on that. But anyway, involving citizens in very different ways has been one big part of our success, and also normalizing environmental work. We don't have an, any, a, an, a specialized environmental program or a city strategy that has a box for environmental activities. The whole city strategy is, the name of the city strategy is a bold environmental city. So it's everything what we do follows the same guideline and same strategy. This year as the European Green Capital we have concentrated on four main areas. One what it needs to be to have a carbon neutral life in a city how you <coughs> what we have to do in order to find to reach this goal and find an urban lifestyle that is sustainable citizen participation as already said very important for us and in Latvia I'm very happy that we have a very different political parties but a very large majority behind the ambitious environmental programs and goals Circular economy, already over 10% of our business turnover. And also have to say, in business, the change is now very rapid and very fast. It's faster than in a political debate. And this is a very interesting situation and problem. Uh, I was also participating in the GOP in Glasgow. And we had a very good dialogue, uh, public dialogue, with my colleagues from Oslo and Stockholm. So we three mayors, we debated on how cities in Nordic countries are moving forward. And we all made the same remark. Political debate right now and discussion is behind on what businesses and financial bodies have already decided how to move forward. So the change is happening and it's faster than we ever thought. And we also already have our next target on site. Lahti is committed to be carbon neutral already by 2025. That's 10 years ahead of our national target and of course far ahead of the European Union target. Based on our latest calculations uh, this May, we are on that track. So it's, it's possible and I hope it's likely that we'll reach that target by 2025. But of course, that's only one step forward. We have to move forward, reaching that goal very early but still, it's not the end result. We are moving forward. We also have uh, utilized very creative and successful methods on how we involve local people and how we communicate this with, uh, with our community. We are home for the world's first carbon neutral symphony orchestra, Latin Symphony. We are also home for the world's first professional ice hockey team that is carbon neutral, Lahti Pelicans, that plays in the Finnish Elite League. So, I have no illusions that when the mayor says something, people listen. Uh, also, when the experts say something, that everybody will listen. But when a captain of our most popular sports team goes in front of cameras and says, I want my team to become carbon neutral, and my whole team is working on that, and it's normal, and that's what everybody has to do. It's a very powerful tool and message for the community, and it's also normalizing the idea of a carbon neutral, sustainable city. So we have been utilizing this, and we are moving forward uh, uh, this, with this idea that it's not the mayor's job or an expert job. It's about everybody doing good things for their city. And they have a concrete example. The city and the community already cleaned the lake. So there's a con people of Lahti know that there are concrete results on an environmental work that we do together. So we are only moving forward step by step, making these, these steps towards a more sustainable city. And of course, dear friends, a sustainable city must be a better city for everyone. It's not about numbers, it's not about facts and figures. They are important, of course. But it's about how people of the city feel about their city. Is the city changing for the better? Is it creating better opportunities? Is, uh, am I feeling better for my, how my city feels? So sustainable city is not enough that it's sustainable. It must be a better city. Otherwise, we can't reach that target. So. Dear friends, Lahti is a city that has changed a lot. We, beginning of 1990s, we were a collapsed industrial city 
with a Finnish record on unemployment. 29.7% was in unemployment in December 1992. And the city has had no path forward. Since that, we have worked in various different areas to make a positive change in our city. And today, we are not brown anymore. Today, we are green. And we are very happy that today, being a green is something what all cities must do. So we haven't taken any different path from other cities. We only have moved on that path a bit faster than other cities. What we have done is something what all cities must do, and what we have done is still not enough. So, dear friends, this is my short introduction and presentation about Lahti, this year's European Green Capital. Thank you. That was very inspiring. I had so many questions in my mind, but you basically almost answered all of them <laughs> in one presentation. But um, you already touched upon the numbers, but I'm still curious. Like, what exactly does this bring to Lahti? Like, the employment numbers are, the are inc increasing? They are increasing. We are still not where we should be. So we, we had a very deep hole to come out from. Mm -hmm. But the point is that today, what is very interesting in the last two years, is that when we say now that we will be carbon neutral by 2025, and we have this credibility to do something what we have promised, is that it brings also a very competitive business environment. Mm. And this is something I, I would like to put into this discussion uh, in today's world, being an, an advanced environmental city and providing a carbon neutral business environment mm -hmm. is a competitive edge. And we are now seeing that very clearly only within the last one and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. So now all the businesses are joining. And, and we had a seminar just a month ago where most important employers in our city said, we are committed to the same target. And now city must keep their promise and we will keep our promise mm. because it's good for everyone. So this change has been significant. Mm. So what I would want to point out that having a ambitious environmental goals is also a good, uh, good uh, uh, strategy for economic development. Mm. That's a very, very interesting and important message. I was, just, I was still wondering, was it difficult to get the companies um, involved and was it, or was it easy to create a common goal or was it a struggle uh, in the beginning? It's now far much easier than it used to be. Yeah. But also, as I said, businesses are actually now evolving and changing faster mm. than local political debate. Mm. Mm. And we had a relatively good starting point, even, but even mm. us we have this difficulty how to make sure that the political debate understands the change that is around us. Mm. Also, this brings us new opportunities. We are, this is not public yet, but I will give you a secret. We probably will be also the first city in Finland to issue a green bond. So we are putting our environmentally friendly investments together and going out for the finance markets uh, to get a very good funding uh, as, so issuing a green bond. And this is an also another thing. Today's financial markets, also for municipalities, they support sustainable projects and investments from the municipalities. So we will, our uh, foresight is that we will get a better funding deal when we go out with the green bond. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great tip for all the other regions listening yeah. in today. Um, you will get a chance to ask questions from Pekka as well later today. Uh, I will thank you for now uh, for this presentation and there will be a panel discussion later today. So you will get to hear more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Truly inspiring words for Lahti. Uh, so now we'll actually move across the Baltic to Sweden.
uh, and uh, talk to Johan Kylenstjärna, who is chair of the Swedish Climate Policy Council. Um, you're also adjunct professor and senior advisor on sustainability to the president of Stockholm University. So we could say that you have more of the research perspective, but I would also call you quite a lot of a climate activist, to be honest, right? And you'll tell us more about how to design effective climate policy with regional impact. So Johan, please take it away. Let's hope that your presentation appears on the screen here. Thank you very much. First of all, can you hear me? Yes. Then I will also see if I can get my presentation online. Let's see. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Oh, no. Now we can see it. Can you see it now? Yes. Excellent. So thank you very much for inviting me to this really excellent program and conference. It is actually quite difficult to come directly after uh, Mayor Timon. And I think you, he has summarized a lot of the dimensions and the perspectives that I will try to also convene in terms of effective climate policy with impact. Uh, it's an illustrative example of the, the journey that Lahti has done. And I think that looking at the different dimensions of this journey is really about how you can move, in this case, a city from being having huge challenges in terms of environment, but also many other challenges to, to make it into a green city where you can also see a lot of benefits in, in regard of other dimensions. And I think that this is actually extraordinary. We are coming out of the COP26 meeting, and as also the mayor was stressing, politics in many ways are struggling today. I would argue that COP26 in many ways was quite successful, but it's also very clear that other actors are becoming more and more important. We now have the final Paris Agreement in, in place, including the Paris rulebook. So the negotiations did in the end work out quite fine. What is interesting is, of course, in COP26, is the fact that we see the leadership of so many other actors, the business, the private sector, but also cities, regions. And I think this is absolutely essential. So the question is then, the Nordic uh, region and global leadership, is this important? Well, I think the mayor has demonstrated this. And I actually think there are many good examples of where Nordic leadership makes a difference and how important it is, because the world is still struggling. The world is struggling to get out of fossil fuels. The world is struggling to get out of fossil fuels in a fair way, the just transition that also the panel talked about earlier. Making sure that this doesn't become an agenda just of getting out of fossil fuel, but actually being an agenda of development where we have a better future for generations to come. And the Nordic leadership there is essential. We are welfare states. We have a tradition, a history of being able to manage environmental resources with socioeconomic development. Of course, with a lot of challenges, and this is something that Nord Regio has also pointed out in many cases, the task of achieving carbon neutral neutrality in the Nordic region is even bigger than it seems. And I think this is absolutely fundamental. We have to understand that this is not an easy transi transition. And it's not just about technology. It's more about people, how we ma manage to move in that direction. So these are some characteristics of our region. We have high CO2 per capita, but a decoupling ambition that actually shows. And also, I think the Lachte case was very interesting here. We also talked earlier in the, in the program, there was a mentioning of consumption-based uh, emissions. And the second point, there is clearly a challenge for us in the Nordic region. We are a globalized economy and whatever we do here in this region have implications in other parts of the world. And one thing we cannot accept, of course, in terms of effective policies is if we export our emissions to other parts of the world. We have a very diverse industry, which is actually an advantage. We even have oil and gas industry in Norway, not least, but also in Denmark. And as we heard earlier, could potentially also in Greenland and other parts of the Nordic region. We have heavy industry, we have forestry, agriculture, we have high tech, we have services. 
We have all this diversity that in many ways reflect the world. So in our transition, in terms of effective policies, can we manage all the different uh, conflicts that will arise when we are transferring from one part, one type of economy to another? How do we deal with the challenges also related to phasing out fossil fuels in the case of Norway, for instance? We are top performers in terms of innovations and entrepreneurship. This is absolutely fundamental in the new economy to be developed. And we are top performers in terms of welfare states. So, yes, we have a lot of um, abilities or opportunities to take this leadership. But impl it implies also that we address some of the fundamental challenges that also are associated with developing effective policies. This is, of course, something that I'm very much having my everyday life in the role of the Swedish Climate Policy Council, where we evaluate Swedish government policies related to the climate targets. And interestingly enough, it's not just about, again, the technologies and decisions related to the transition as such. But more and more, it is about the acceptability, the acceptance of society, the more socio-economic dimensions of the transition. And here, I would argue, through our welfare states, building our welfare states, we also have a lot of experiences to share. And as the mayor also said, we have an increasingly strong Nordic business also driving transformation in not just the so-called easy areas, technologies or the tech industries or the service industry, but also the fact that we have a lot of heavy industry in the Nordic countries is an advantage in this case. And if we are looking at just headlines, recent headlines, we can see this ambition playing out from Finland's, the toughest actually ambition on a global scale for a country, ca carbon neutrality by 2035, which requires that Lahti and other cities are there earlier, which you have committed to, but also in other parts of the economy where we can see this innovation playing out through companies and the whole business sector in many ways. The effective po climate policy is about the storyline. And I, I was really intrigued by you, Mayor, when you described how you have moved a city, obviously, where you had huge challenges, 30% unemployment, loss of industry, and projecting instead a new city, building on a green transition that creates opportunities for people. The just transition that we are talking about, which makes things so much more complicated. And I, you know, I'm sorry for this rather complicated graph maybe, but I would like to really focus on that, this aspect because I think the previous speakers, all of them have really moved within that particular box. We should listen to science, no doubt when we make decisions. We have scientific insights, we have technologies, we have all these kinds of things. So making decisions based on that should be quite easy. But we know from COP, we know from the transitions in our own countries, we know from the transitions in Lakti, that really the challenge is within that circle. All these other aspects of society, we have different uh, interests, we have different opinions, we have different values, we may have different goals. This is what effective policies must address. They must be based on science, they must be based on best available technologies, but we have to understand where the challenges are, and they are mostly in these areas, in our heads and in how society is built up and constructed. So the vision the storyline is important. Uh, Mayor, you have that one to the right. Of course, many people still perceive the future as we see it on the left there. This is essential. This is also an important part of policymaking, being able to tell a story. What is it that we want to achieve? How will the future look like? What, what are the aspirations of government, of business, of local communities, of regions in terms of the transition? So we should not underplay the storyline and setting this vision. We, we have in Sweden, as you know, to try to be the world's first fossil free uh, wealth or country. Now Finland is competing with us with 2035, which is great. I like this competition. It's not a race to the bottom, it's a race to the top. And we have similar uh, now in Europe. So here you can see the story is about the welfare region. It's not just about being fossil free. And 
the Nord Radio has also communicated this in your strategy. The Nordic region will become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world. This is a storyline. This is not just about sustainability. It's about what we want to achieve beyond uh, the transition. And the fact, of course, that the solution exists and that the green economy, just like we heard before, is based on innovation. It creates jobs and ensures competitiveness. But it doesn't do so automatically. This is about uh, effective policy making. How can we ensure that this actually happens and that it doesn't just happen in certain regions, in urban areas, but also really becomes an issue for the rural urban uh, fairness in, the, in this respect? The second part is about the systems transformation. I would argue that this drives innovation, collaboration and investments. We can see now in many cases how business and politics are working more in systems, how different di business sectors are working together and finding new solutions. But the system transformation is also about understanding the effects of the policies we are developing and implementing. So it's not just about finding the solutions, but also understanding the effects, the impacts on people that the panel talked about before, the impact on the economy. If we are looking at sectors individually, we will not be able to see the systems, the challenges, but also the system opportunities. So for instance, this quote about bioeconomy, that is really on the economic scale, a systems dimension. What does it imply to move towards a bioeconomy? What are, are the advantages, but what are also the, the, um, the uh, um, sort of challenges that are related to this? Similarly, when we are looking at many of the transition sectors right now, electrification, the use of biomass, I could see in the energy system of Lachti, biomass is a critical resource, but we also know the debate that has now started on forestry. Uh, and we have always these challenges. And if we don't see the systems dimension, understand how all these are connected, the fact that electrification may need shifts in laws and regulations and permits to really play out, we will get stuck. So effective policies must take that into consideration. The policy integration is absolutely essential and this is something we are really focusing very much on in the Swedish Climate Policy Council. Our mandate is not to evaluate climate policies. We have the mandate to evaluate all policies of society, of government. The reason for this is of course that now everything is part of the transition. It's not a climate transition, it's an economic transition. It's not a green transition, it is an economic transition. We need then to make sure that the policy dimensions and the policies we are formulating really address all these different dim dimensions. And we really need to understand where the true power is. Most of the true power is in fiscal policy, to be honest, regardless if we are talking about the global, regional, national or local level. But of course, equally important is industrial policies, transport, energy policies, agriculture, forestry. So looking at it from a very narrow climate policy dimension tends to underestimate the importance of really getting into the true policy arenas where the power really is. We recommend that in our last report to the government that climate must be an integrated part of the climate or the climate or the financial system of Sweden. This is challenging because it means that we are um, really challenging new groups in society, decision makers that need to understand what it implies having a climate lens, a transition lens when you're looking at policy development. So this is about integrating the climate dimension, the transition dimension, the green economy dimension into the overall financial and economic system and of course the overall system deciding how different sectors will develop. My final point uh, in this short intervention is about understanding how we as a Nordic region also relates to the rest of the world. I started off by stating that we have a particular uh, role and a particular responsibility I would argue being one of the most or the richest regions of the world with high technology, a diverse business, to also take a leadership position. I, for one, 
really think that Nordic collaboration need to be further strengthened. There is no doubt about that. As, not as a competition to other uh, regional uh, collaborative um, bodies like the EU, but the Nordic region has the potential of being really leaders in the world in terms of this transition. But we have to understand that the geopolitics will affect us. And also we have to understand that what we do will have an impact also on other parts of the world. Regional policymaking must uh, understand and address this. This is just to give one example. Rapidly changing technologies like solar power, wind power, is completely changing the energy landscape. How do you develop policies that are... Um, that are flexible enough to uh, take on board technological changes, rapidly technological changes. When you plan for energy systems, for instance, like the case in Lakhti, where you moved away from coal to bioenergy, where bioenergy may be the next challenge in a couple of years. So we have to understand how technologies are now really shaping policy in a different way than it has before. And at the same time, how we can make sure policies are flexible enough to apprehend new developments. We also need to understand the shifting powers of natural resources. We are moving out from a system, and this affects us, part of the Nordic countries are, in particular Norway in this case, of course, are connected to a sector that from this dimension is on its way out and it's recognized by people within the sector as well but we are not just leaving one sector and entering into or one system the fossil fuel based system into renewable energy without challenges so we also have to understand what the new dimensions the new challenges the new environmental impacts will imply someone mentioned earlier the whole issue of uh, wind power and how this starts to create uh, conflicts in parts of our region, in our country. And I recognize this not least from Sweden as well. But that's just one example. We also have all the minerals of the world where that we need for the transition, for digitalization, for solar, for wind, whatever it might be. Just the mobile telephone, as you know, contains about 50 different minerals. We have mineral resources in our countries, but there are also a lot of conflicts related to them. So effective policies in terms of land use, which I really like that you mentioned before, needs, they need to consider this. How can we make sure that if we need to start uh, or increase exploration, that this can also consider these kinds of dimensions? But we also need to understand if we do not uh, use the resources we have in our Nordic countries, they will come from somewhere else. So our decisions in terms of the climate transition will have impacts on other parts of the world. And we can see similar areas in terms of green resources, how our decisions will have an impact on other parts of the world and how we are impacted also with what happens in other parts. Forestry is a case in point, an extremely important sector for our Nordic countries we know that policy changes will come, not least increasingly from, from the EU. How will this impact our uh, freedom of developing policies? And how can we also be a good example in terms of forestry management in other parts of the world? So effective policies. Well, you know, I've mentioned a few things and I think that this more, more echoes the previous presentation. In the end, it is about people. If we do not do this the right way, we will see opposition. We will see political changes making the transition even more difficult. So effective policies always need to take the starting point from society and from people, even if they are based on science and best available knowledge. And we have to understand that climate impacts also in our region will start to have a bigger influence. So effective policies in terms of the transition also needs to much more consider the impacts on society that climate change will have in the coming decades. So thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion after the three presentations. And I'm, of course, available to respond to any question that you may have. So thank you.
Osa's mic. You need to turn on your mic. Okay, it's on. It's on. Yes. She said it's on. Just take one of the hand mics. How does this sound? Very good. Right. Uh, it's good with uh, with extra options and alternatives, right? We all and we need to be very innovative and you know always find solutions. So you want, I don't know. I mean, you also answered a lot of the follow-up questions that I had prepared, and I also don't want to take too much time because I will soon have time for the Q and A session here. But but um, you you actually do sound quite hopeful, although there is so many complexities here. Do you see? I mean, you you have most insights into how the Swedish government and policy system works with these issues. Does that give you hope? Do you think that they can handle with the way the system is rigged to handle all these interactions between the policies and to cross the silos that you're talking about? Or what's your uh, hope or fear when it comes to, you know, making this happen? I think the goodwill is there and, and you know, what the advantage of at least the system we have in Sweden, I think in many Nordic countries, is the fact that we have quite broad support, the, you know, regardless of political parties. So seven out of eight parties stand behind the policy framework, which I think is very, very important. However, it is very clear in looking at the reality of impl implementation now, that we really face all these challenges that we tend to talk about in terms of really speeding up um, the transition. So politics, I think, will have to move much more towards enabling other actors to really take action, to be honest. Cities, mm -hmm. businesses, regions. Mm -hmm. That, I think, will be absolutely essential uh, moving ahead because politics tends, unfortunately, to get stuck. I think increasingly today, unfortunately. Um, I tend to agree on that, but let's hear more than what we can do at the policy level. So please, uh, uh, Pekka Timonen, welcome back up on stage. And also please join us, Anna-Lena Seppele, your head of unit at the Ministry of Environment here in Finland. And you happen to also be the member of the, of the Nordic senior group of senior officials on regional policy. And Finland is also the president of the Nordic Council of Ministers this year. So I know that you've been hosting several meetings and that you're leading the way also uh, in the Nordic collaboration this year. Um, so the three of you and you are, we still have you with us as well on screen, uh, represent different perspectives on leadership on just green transition, the national, local and research uh, spheres. Uh, so. Uh, Please, to start, tell us what you see as crucial next steps in the policy toolbox to respond to COP and speed up this shift. Uh, I mean, I, I think you've, you've all touched upon this before, but maybe I'll, I'll leave the uh, floor first to, to Anna-Lena here to say something from, from the Finnish perspective and the national level. I hope that, yeah, test, I just test it. Is it on? Yeah, just okay, keep it thank close you. to your mouth. Yes, uh, on this Nordic level, so we are, of course, uh, following our vision of becoming the most uh, sustainable integrated region in the world. So all the the things we do in the committee aim to that, and, and we have, have different uh, topics on these ministerial meetings. Uh, for example, this green recovery and, and multi-locality and how they can they can promote this green transition. But in the, in the uh, national level in Finland, we, we have a lot of things going on because uh, we, you heard that we have this aim of being carbon neutral already 2035, so it's quite, quite ambitious and we have to uh, do things to get there and, and, and also strong leadership and the, the climate issues are very uh, high on the list of our government right now and we have a round table that is chaired by the prime minister and we have a minister group 
that is shared with our environment and climate minister. And it's the first in Finland to be environment and climate minister. And uh, in, uh, in the Ministry of Environment, we have the mandate to land use and regional planning policies and also building that has a lot, lot of the carbon footprint. And then also waste policies and the biodiversity. So we sit on a lot of the topics that are very important right now and have to take our responsibility. And we are now reforming our very important laws. That we have a reformation of the Climate Change Act in, in going on, and also our Land Use and Building Act that has actually quite big role in this climate, in climate change mitigation and adaptation because uh, a lot of the footprint comes from land use and building and, and there we have the kind of a steering thought is this climate change. Uh, so you're uh, creating the, the framework here, so to mm. speak. Then it's really interesting to hear from Lahti, from Pekka Timonen. What do you think this, this, uh, this collaboration between the, the, the local and the national level? Uh, do, do, you, do you think you have a, a better uh, framework or a better playground now, so to speak, to, to uh, enable your vision, to, to realize your vision for the, for the green capital of Lahti also beyond 2021? Or what, what else would you like to oh, see? I, I would say first that you, you are, touch, you are, yeah, please. You, are uh, you are touching a very critical question. How we, <coughs> how we put together a local action goals and activities, then a national policy and national initiatives and even even uh, uh, possibilities, and then international Nordic and international framework and, and those possibilities, for example, European Green Deal, uh, etc. And I would say this is not easy, this is actually very difficult. <laughs> so I would not not say that this happens like, like uh, flows like water. It's, it is difficult and for example right now municipalities in Finland are quite strongly disagreeing with the new legislation proposal for the, for the land use and planning. Because Luckily, you're a democracy, so exa you can exactly. Have this so there's debate a debate on, on that, yeah. but of course. And what would you like to see instead? Uh, we would like to see less bureaucracy and more action, ah. and and good. and and, and, and that's good. that's like that's like an overall rule, but uh, but yes, that's uh, and I think we have to discuss. We have to find better ways on putting these things together and finding these paths for uh, for uh, for uh, for a faster development. And, and and also we have to find out the what blocks us to do so. Mm -hmm. What are the limitations and what are the in our decision making processes or other elsewhere that are not allowing us to move forward as fast as we would like to do. And I'm sure you already analyzed this in Lahti. So would you like to say one example of well, that stumbling block? One thing what is actually annoying us is that our government policies are working so that the the government funding comes in when the last ones on the row wants to become in. So we were not, we were in finding our own money to invest on a more sustainable energy, more sustainable networks, etc. And now government is coming in mm -hmm. to give a lot of money for those who haven't done so. Mm -hmm. So the initiative, you know, the where are the, you know, the price should be for those who are moving fast, mm -hmm. not for those who are moving slow. Mm -hmm. Anna-Lena, maybe you'd like to comment on this, because no, we can that, also that, realize that, 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 that there is, is there is a logic behind. It's difficult to be the forerunner. Yeah. When you do the things first, others follow. And maybe we are a little bit slow, but uh, government has had quite a lot of funding with this green recovery fund funds and, and for, for example, phasing out oil, oil energy, oil heating and, and other things. And then we have, we, we think that everything happens locally and the things go forward only locally mm -hmm. and that's why we try to also, co also cooperate with, with the s municipalities and cities. Mm -hmm. We have uh, programs for sustainable cities and the 
the climate solutions in, in municipalities. And then we have also these agreements on the, the bigger city regions that uh, concern uh, land use, housing and traffic. Mm -hmm. And there also are quite big uh, uh, financing also from the government side. Uh, but uh, but maybe we are a little slow, but uh, we. Um, I must thank you for being such a good foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Uh, before I also uh, involve uh, and engage our our audience, I just wanted a comment from you one as well, if you could can keep it brief. What do you see in Sweden in terms of of the effectiveness of the climate policies on uh, how it impacts on on the transition at local levels? Would you like to comment, or do you see any anything resembling this also in Sweden? Yes, uh, absolutely. And and just let me comment very quickly. I mean, what the mayor, what Timonen, Mayor Timonen is describing is a very typical example of being a first mover. So hopefully there are other advantages there. Um, I also congratulate that you have now in Finland a, a, an environment and climate minister. We have that in Sweden as well. What I would hope is that the Nordic countries will be the first having a finance and climate minister. I Yay, think that finance and climate minister. Let's work that, for that. that and, and we that should send that different. message. And to, it, goes to a bit, it, it goes a little bit back to just your question there. Yes, you know, in terms of challenges, we, we face similar challenges. Remember that our council, we are looking at uh, government policies and we get a lot of questions from municipalities. You know, could we also look at exactly the effectiveness of the whole policy chain from the local level up to the national level? Because they see very similar challenges, I would argue, that we see in Finland. Um, and one aspect coming back and i will end with that one is not least related to partly what you said the whole sort of investment structure because these this will require huge investments and we also need to have a permit structures that enable investments to be fast enough for the transition and so these are you know where we are struggling between the local and the national level and the responsibilities there so i think it's we have similar uh, you know challenges in the nordic countries no doubt Thank you, Johan. So let's hear from our audience. Do we have any? Yeah, maybe first we'll see what we have in our chat online. Following the digital chat, I don't know if I'm, uh, you can hear me online, but <laughs> at least here. So one question to Pekka is about uh, that one uh, digital participant was uh, noticing that Lakti is focusing a lot on the carbon neutrality instead of the climate uh, neutrality. Was the ration, what was the rationality behind that? Well, that's the, the how way we have formulated it. But of course, as I said, it's not like a one target. It's it's one step ahead in a long road. So we our aim is not, and I think we, this with it's great to have targets. It's very important. And in decision making, you have to have that. It's it makes it possible. It makes it concrete. You make a plan and strategy and move forward. But yet, in the same time, it's very important to understand. And when you, when we are developing a sustainable urban model and a, and a sustainable kind of a society and a just transition, uh, there's no the, the end goal is far, and we will probably not ever get there finally. So that's the target. What we have fits to us, and it's good for us. But of course, we are not stopping there. It's it's like uh, as you said in our Lahti story, there have been several uh, uh, kind of uh, steps on our way, and that's yet another another step in a long road. And that's another thing, the long-term perspective on this. Thank you. You had another question. Yes, to Johan, and uh, the question is about whether Swedish Climate Policy Council has also uh, where look, uh, has also looked at the degrowth question, and uh, there is a reference also to work uh, by uh, KTH that has uh, done a project on futures beyond GDP growth. So, has uh, Swedish Policy Council uh, Climate Policy Council has also done something in this regard? Uh, the, the quick answer there is no, um, and one I, I, I'm aware of this very interesting work that KTH is doing. Uh, the reason is that really our mandate is to evaluate government policies, so government decisions, and there has no not been any decisions related to degrowth. Um, I, I don't think any governments have made <laughs> actually decisions in that direction, to be honest. However, it is a question that we are bringing in more and more, and, and a lot of other speakers have also talked about the consumption dimension of things. 
And I should say that as a policy council, we don't look at consumption-based emissions either. But there is right now a political process in Sweden ongoing to potentially bring that in as part of a target, a, a national target on consumption-based uh, emissions. And if that happens, I think the whole question about our economic system and uh, also partly potentially, you know, the whole degrowth debate and so on will be brought into as part of, of, um, of uh, more the political discussion, but not as it is today, no. I think it's great that you brought this up, uh, whoever posed this question, and it was also part of my questions here. And, and uh, please, uh, Pekka, just, just uh, briefly, comment on it. We are also working on that, so that's also for us. The consumption-based calculation is a very important one. And, and so it's about deepening our understanding and, and defining better what, what are the most effective ways of, of moving forward. But I really agree with you, and that that's, that's, that's an important point to be taken. It seems like it's it's the it's the most sort of fluid target for us. It's very hard to 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 get some real action going there. So I think that's also a good ground for for more Nordic knowledge exchange on how to tackle this issue. So we have an audience question, please. Thank you. Uh, super inspiring to hear about the changes that have been made in Lahti. One thing that uh, came up in your presentation and that has been often brought up in Nordic context is that uh, producing heating is still mainly done through combustion or as a byproduct of combustion. So do you have any plans to change that in, in Lahti or then do you have like national plans on how we could move away from or how we could produce heat in a more environmentally friendly way or potentially through sustainable and uh, renewable resources? All right, thank you. Yeah, Pekka, I yeah. think you, you start here. And I think you had also pointed out the same question. So we think that's a one step again. It's not the end result. So let's say... Uh, 2035 maybe is the next step but also we are taking a lot of effort on on how we do that it's also not about what you do it's about how you do that and our engineers always say don't say that we burn anything because we gasify it which is a very big difference as they say and and also also that not a single tree is cut where while we while when we are using bioenergy and we also built our big plant so that it can very easily shift to different sources of, 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 of energy. But you are right, producing heat and district heating in all Nordic countries, more or less, is a big question. And, and it's, a big, it's a big source of, of our CO2 emissions. So this game is actually very simple. Energy, traffic, building an infrastructure. Solve this tree and you already work quite far. Thank you. Johan, do you want to comment from a Swedish perspective here? No, just again that it's it's very similar to the discussions we have in Sweden. Uh, I mean, the challenge to really communicate the fact that the bioenergy primarily that we are using are, of course, waste products from the forest industry when it comes to energy. Um, but also, I mean, the fact that we are burning a lot of, of waste, which still represents actually one of the fossil emissions that we have in Sweden. And that is a still a failure of the system as long as we have to burn a lot of waste, I would argue, from a circular economy and resource efficiency point of view. Mm. Um, and finally, then, what we haven't talked so much about, equally important as when, you know, when we talk about consumption based resources, uh, emissions and so on, is the fact that we must talk much more about resource efficiency in general. And this comes in in this debate about uh, our energy systems and so on. The transition requires a lot of energy efficiency. And we shouldn't forget, of course, that district heating is one of the successes of the Nordic countries also. So even if we have still challenges there compared to other parts of the world, this is an extraordinary efficient form of energy distribution in, in society. So we shouldn't forget also this dimension. So it's, it's still part of our Nordic leadership and it's a step on the way then, but it, we're not fully there. But uh, Anna-Lena, please comment also from the policy perspective in Finland, how to work more with the resource management here. Uh, yes, uh, we want to work for the circular economy so that the, uh, we, the, we have this end of waste, that we, we don't produce waste or everything circulates. And then uh, we also uh, want to promote uh, clean energy. We have a lot of uh, wind power 
going on. And actually, it's quite uh, affordable nowadays the, the, uh, on, on, on land, but uh, we still need, need to fund and promote the building of wind power offshore. And that's a great potential too in Finland. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, please. I'm actually not sure if the mic is on. Just see, make sure it's on. Thank you. Now you hear me. Yes. Yes. Very interesting presentation and from different perspectives. Um, I, was, I have a couple of questions. I'm very happy to hear about the consumption-based emissions coming up from, from uh, also the Swedish Climate Council as a suggestion because, I mean, if you look at much literature, you'll find that the more we earn the higher the consumption, the higher emissions. And uh, I know from Cicero in Oslo University, they've done quite a good calculations on this, uh, where they also show the calculations where we are the consumers, and China and Pakistan and Bangladesh are the not very emitting very much if we took away our consumption. So that was a comment. Uh, when it c then there was the issue around uh, buildings. Uh, I was in Scotland at the COP26, and I also moved away around between different Scottish houses and uh, got colder and colder, <laughs> because they don't have district heating. They have each their own gas boiler based on natural gas and not any insulation. And it's, I think it's an incredible good thing we have in the Nordics that we put a lot of efforts into uh, insulation and uh, having good energy systems for the houses. But my final question is actually mostly related to m maybe both Johan and to Annalena on land use. Because if we are continuing the, the consumption that we have, I mean, we, we will need to produce quite a lot of energy. And uh, I live, at the, for the time being at least, in Denmark, and we have a lot of competition about the use of land for many different uh, uses and I know it's the case other places and are we using it for wind are we using it for solar or for food or for forest or mm -hmm. there is a lot of competition around and uh, I think really there's a huge issue there to solve for the policymakers around the land use and I was curious about wh how it is in Finland and second I also wonder a little bit why not put solar panels on the top of all the industries in the suburban areas example. That could also be an issue to develop more. Thank you. So maybe, Annalena, you could comment in this new act that is being uh, developed. How are yes, you uh, considering uh, this Yes, because issue? There, um, uh, the land use, it, it needs to be planned well, so that we have these different functions that are, in a way, uh, put together so that it, it, it promotes this uh, climate change also. And, and, and the, the the question of the forests is, of course, important because uh, they are as carbon sinks, and that's why uh, we have to uh, to try to inhibit that we have the, this urban sprawl. We rather densify the and use the existing infrastructure, and that's the best way to promoting uh, working for for climate change in, in cities. And that's uh, the, well, in a way, a clue in in all this, is this our new act also. Pekka, would you like to comment from your local level the land use conflicts in Lahti? Could you give us a picture? What's the main conflict area, or how did you have find a good solution? And of course, one one question is about land use is always how de how how you, what's the you, what's the the what's positive about making a dense city and urban urban structure and how you do that and what does it really mean it's not that easy as you might think about how it really what is an impact on certain solutions uh, but of course um, in Denmark the, the fight for the land is on, on a totally different level than in Finland where we have a, a big country and very very few people on a huge land scale but still on cities and urban areas of course we are we are having that, and then the the 
for example, last week's debate we had uh, when when uh, cities uh, and the Finnish system, when you protect certain areas, is that the only way how to save that area? So we are also saying, no, it's not. We also can just make a city, make the decision that we keep in certain areas and their biodiversity as it is and let it develop. You know, just not only have a one way of protecting land, but cities can also do a lot by by just making decisions themselves and then maybe later there comes these decisions on on, on, on having a, a fully protected or other things. But but these kind of things what the key question is that you kind of know what you are doing. <laughs> but, but the conflict between green energy production and, oh, for yes. example, pristine yeah, land yeah, or yeah, keeping of the land oh, of for course. recreation. That, that is a question. And, and that will be the question in the future too. But, but uh, you don't have to always use the pristine land. You can reuse some land that has already been used for other purposes and then put, for example, solar panels as we, as we did. The second largest solar power system or power station is now under construction in Lahti, and that's using an old brownfield. Ah. So, so old brownfields just take the uh, <coughs> useless storages away, and we are now putting a big uh, solar power plant on that site. Thank you so much. Actually, yeah, I don't know if you wanted a uh, quick maybe a final comment. comment. That, uh, the solar p panels, it's wholly possible to put them on the, on the roofs and, and actually we have the kind of reuse of uh, areas for example uh, previous swamps and that are uh, redeveloped with with solar panels but in the densifying the green um, green structure is very important because we have to uh, have the continuity yeah. in it but uh, but it doesn't need to be uh, in a way protected uh, mm. Just doing it. Just doing it. I think that's a great final word uh, that we all need to to uh, to consider uh, every day in our uh, because we all have a responsibility, right, for the green transition, and that's also something that you one pointed out. Please give a big hand to our speakers. Thank you so much. And uh, now we're, it's actually time. Yes. Yeah, so I would like to thank you, and then actually turn to our screen again, and we'll start the second part of our program here with our Nordic tour, tour de Nordics, as my dear colleague has put it. So uh, yeah, I will ask you to sit down. Thank you. Um, so yes. Yes, very welcome, uh, Anna Esbjörn. I hope that you are with us now. Yes, you I am are. With you. Hey, Hello. Anna, connecting with you directly from Copenhagen. So, our Nordic tour uh, will bring us even further uh, out into the what's going on at the local level in the Nordic countries. And we've talked about Denmark today, but we haven't had a Danish speaker so far. So we're now really curious to hear more from you. So Anna Esbjorn, you're the head of, of program of the Cities of the Future at Consito, which is Denmark's green think tank. And you're heavily involved in a uh, national-wide these days program called DK2020, where you, together with KL, Kommunernas uh, Landsförening, and Real Dania, are basically supporting all Danish municipalities to create climate action plans and move forward in their climate adaptation and mitigation work. So, and Anna, five, tell us more and about the five it. Regions. Yes. yes, and the five regions, of course, which is another game changer in a Danish context. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think, just tell us more about this ambitious program. And I, I, I think we should also mention that it's, it's, it's world leading. It's, it's a very ambitious program to try and get all municipalities on board uh, with the same toolbox, of course, adjusting to, to local, local needs. But anyways, but, but what was the trick here, Anna? How did you get so many mu municipalities on board and also the regions? Maybe start there and tell us more about the program itself. Yes, I will. 
Well, DK2020 started with a pilot program in 2019. Uh, it came out from the recognition that um, in Denmark, it's required by law to make adaptation plans, but it's not required by law to make uh, mitigation plans. So we could see that not all municipalities were making uh, mitigation plans. And uh, we, we decided to start a pilot project together with Real Dania, this philanthropic association, and C40 Cities. Um, because C40 Cities had uh, created this uh, climate action planning framework that we are using as, a, as our method. Um, and we decided to test it on pilot municipalities in a kind of speed process in 2019 where we uh, we made a call for climate ambitious municipalities in april and they only had uh, one and a half month to uh, reply if they wanted to sign up or not and that was including a mayor commitment so a political commitment um, we started out saying that we wanted we could have 20 municipalities in the program and uh, we thought it was maybe a little too much to ask for, but we got 31 applications. So suddenly we could see that there was a lot of uh, longing for a, a network of uh, ambitious leaders and municipalities. So we started with 20 municipalities in 2019. Uh, in 2020, we onboarded another 44 municipalities and by that time, the pro project had grown from a pilot program into a full blown uh, program. Um, and last year, we uh, we onboarded another 31 municipalities. So right now we have 95 out of 98 municipalities uh, working on making uh, climate action plans following the C40 standard and um, the 96th municipalities, uh, the city of Copenhagen or the municipality of Copenhagen, and they already had a C40 approved climate action plan. So almost all of Denmark's municipalities are right now working on making uh, ambitious plans. And it's not only mitigation. Uh, this method we're working from includes, you have to focus on both adaptation, mitigation, governance and collaboration and ex uh, inclusivity and wider benefits. Uh, so it's a more integrated approach than we've usually done climate action planning before. Um, and we have created this learning network, which is now, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, we've just been, been to the COP26 to present what we're doing in Denmark and it is unheard of and we would like to share our experiences with other countries and hopefully uh, accelerate other and inspire other countries to do the same on a local level. And, and what do they say, the, the mayors, the municipalities who, who are now joining uh, en masse like this? Why, why, would they like, why, why do they like to join? What do they like about this program? Um, how, how does it work for them? Well, it's a commitment to the Paris, uh, the goals of the parents agreement and uh, everybody has to take lead. So we, we see a strong leadership, a strong local leadership. And in Denmark, uh, we have uh, we have the 70 the national goal of 70 percent uh, reduced emissions by 2030 and uh, climate neutral at latest by 2050. And you cannot you cannot do that without the support of the municipalities. So it's a it's a communal uh, action uh, platform. And uh, by signing up to the DK twenty twenty uh, project, they they can support and learn from each other. And that's what we see is working right now, and also working on cross municipal collaboration. Is that where the regions also play a new role, so to speak? That's also where the region uh, regions play a new role because in Denmark it's uh, by uh, authority it's the uh, municipalities who have the authority to do climate action planning, but the regions they take a facilitating role in this uh, project and 
since even though they don't have the legal authority on the climate uh, on the climate agenda they are very strong in facilitating uh, cross municipal action so we usually say you know we need all actors on board and uh, that also include the regions and, and uh, I know that you're also now developing a reporting or monitoring and evaluation system as part of this planning. Could you tell us a little bit more about your, your hopes for that system and what that might deliver in terms of measuring impact here? Yes. I mean, it's, uh, it's part of the program that, or the project that the municipalities have to monitor and eva evaluate their individual uh, climate action plannings and if they are uh, following the, their goals. But as part of the, the overall project, we are right now trying to create a monitoring system uh, where we can follow if the goals set in the DK 2020 are being implemented. So right now, right now we are making uh, the plans, but we need to follow the implementation. And, you know, it, we say, you usually say it's easy to make a plan. It's more uh, difficult to implement the plan. And the monitoring system that we are implementing is focusing on following up on, on the implementation side. And uh, we're creating a, what we call a DK 2020 Climate Alliance, consisting of the mayors from the municipalities that have C40 approved climate action plans, um, working together on monitoring uh, their implementation power. Yeah, and maybe you could also, before I also open up, if there are questions here, uh, I'd also like you to comment on those. Where, where are the sort of risks or limitations in this program? I, I know that you've also been struggling with the consumption-based emissions, for example. So if you wanted to say something about what's, what's not included or what's still sort of work in progress here. Yeah. In the, in the framework we're working from, the Climate Action Planning Framework, it's it's required to work with what we call scope one, two, and just a bit of scope three. And the scope three is where the consumption-based emissions are. So uh, consumption, working with and planning for consumption-based emissions are uh, is a go further uh, uh, step in our uh, pilot, uh, in, in our climate action planning. But we see a lot of Danish municipalities wanting to work with this, but it's still very difficult to, uh, for example, uh, count uh, your uh, consumption-based uh, emissions. Uh, and it's also more difficult because it's, it's not something that you have the authority to do something about yourself. You need to engage. You need to engage the citizens, the uh, companies, etc. So that's where you take on a more facilitating role as a municipalities. So you need to kind of uh, strengthen or uh, stretch out your your uh, your ability to engage uh, people in the climate action planning, and that's where we see difficult. Uh, another thing where uh, the Danish municipalities are working in a different way than the C40 cities is working with the uh, emissions from the agricultural sector uh, because C40 cities is, as the word says, cities and they don't have uh, agriculture. And that's where uh, we have quite uh, a lot of emissions from the agricultural sector and from the transportation sector. And even though municipalities can do a lot, they also need the national level to support the mun municipal action. And uh, I think agriculture and transportation are always also really important uh, issues to be addressed in a dialogue between the national level and the local level. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier to me that that's also one of the benefits that you've seen with this, this huge platform of so many municipalities joining, that you will now be able to speak more with one voice uh, in relation to the national government. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that as well, if you see some, some progress there. Yes, because um, even though the munis Danish municipalities play a very important role in filling out the national uh, climate targets. Um, they are not actually mentioned in the, uh, the national uh, climate uh, plan. Uh, so um, it's, it's a way the DK2020 platform or 
network is a way of getting this uh, common uh, communal voice and and being uh, getting more muscles. Uh, uh, so you know the the legislation can be either adapted or, or uh, be pushed in a in a way that supports the municipal climate action. Thank you. Let's see, Vaida, do we have any any questions in the chat? No special questions. Questions in the audience. Please take a chance to learn more about the Danish system here. I'm sure someone has a question. No? Not really? Yeah, well? Yeah. Ryan, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much for this uh, discussion so far. Uh, we, You briefly touched upon the perhaps the, the rather small-scale approach to the consumption side uh, perspective from, from municipalities. And I mean, frankly, it would be, to me, somewhat concerning if it was a municipal effort to tackle um, consumption emissions uh, alone. Uh, we've heard a little bit from, um, from Pekka earlier about um, individual carbon footprints, and I think we heard from Johan about um, perhaps uh, fiscal frameworks that uh, perhaps could include the consumption perspective, but is there any discussion uh, at the national scale in Denmark uh, alongside these local initiatives about uh, considering some sorts of financial mechanisms to deal with the consumption side uh, and in that connection in an equitable and just way so that those that are less fortunate, those that might not have nearly the same purchasing power as others are not going to be negatively influenced by such uh, an approach. Good question. What do you say, Anand? Well, the, the short answer is no. They are, there are currently no attempts to address that. Um, we, uh, I come from a climate think tank where we say that uh, we, are, uh, we are for a carbon tax, a national carbon tax, because uh, from the perspective that uh, the polluter pays. Um, but on a national level, there's... Uh, there's not a lot of willingness to address that issue. Uh, so right now we don't see uh, national action on that level. We see, on the other hand, the municipalities starting to address the issue, even though it's really difficult. But we, we need to get to that perspective where we address the consumption-based emissions. Thank you, Anna. And I think this also calls for more Nordic collaboration and cross-Nordic learning on how to tackle this issue. We'll collaborate with Lahti, we'll collaborate with other Finnish municipalities and also Danish municipalities and, and from the other Nordic countries. So I think we'll come back to this issue for sure. And thank you so much, Anna, for, for joining us today. And now I'll actually leave the floor back to you, Pipsa. Oh, actually, I have my own microphone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine is still working, I hope. Yes, so the next tour uh, goes to... Yes, hello. Now we should have Stefan Gislason from Iceland with us. Hi, Stefan. Hi, nice to be with you. Yes, we're very Thank happy to have you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you are the founder and managing director of Environice, and that is a consultancy that works with uh, associations of regions and regions to support their climate work. Could you elaborate a little bit more how you work with reg regions before we get started on other questions? Well, yes, uh, what we've been doing, that is me and my colleagues at Environize, we've been doing some calculations of carbon footprint of regions. Uh, on their initiative, it's not, uh, it's not coordinated on the national level or anything, it's just one of the regions started uh, and uh, contacted us to do these calculations to build a base for their climate action planning. Um, and yeah, this, this was the beginning and we've been working with like uh, four different regions 
you could divide Iceland into eight regions. Uh, the regional level is not a level of governance. It's just um, every region has its own uh, regional association of local authorities. Mm. And those are the actors we've been working for. Mm. Thank you. Um, before we dive into, into the regional level more, I would actually like to zoom out a little bit uh, and uh, go to the national level. And uh, if we talk about, in general, uh, the climate goals in the Nordics, as we all already learned today, that Finland has the highest uh, level of ambition, trying to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2030, 2035. And Iceland is not far behind, trying to reach it uh, by 2040. But uh, since 1990s, the uh, emissions have uh, been growing in, in Iceland. So I would also like to hear your opinion uh, when you work with regions. Um, do you think that you are on the right path and you will still make it to that goal? Mm, the honest answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, think we are on the right path. But we used to say that people in Iceland uh, are used to do things quite quickly when they finally start doing them. So hopefully <laughs> we will somehow, uh, you know, get to the goal at the end. But, you know, the situation is in Iceland is uh, somewhat strange uh, compared to other countries because we have so much heavy industries and they're included in ETS, the European uh, Emission Trading Scheme. And that makes it a bit uh, complicated to discuss the national goals because they are some, uh, to some extent included or uh, yeah, connected with the ETS and to some extent the common effort sharing system of the EU. But anyway, uh, in whatever way we look at it, I don't think we are on track. Uh, there's a lot being done. There's a lot of planning taking place. Uh, the government has adopted a climate action plan and they have, uh, you know, changed the legislation uh, for instance, to to uh, to put a requirement therein uh, of climate neutrality in 2040. So now we are required to law to reach that goal. What that goal exactly means, uh, I cannot explain because you know <laughs> it's a matter of definition. What's climate neutrality? Mm. Uh, it's also required by law uh, coming into effect this year that all uh, local authorities and all governmental institutions and companies owned by the state should have their climate policies ready before the end of this year. Or actually, it's, the law doesn't say before the end of this year, but it's, it's uh, interpreted in the way. So now all local authorities are working on their you know, climate plans or mm. climate strategies, and so are hopefully all uh, governmental institutions. However, if you look at this from the uh, municipal point of view, from my point of view, uh, then this uh, requirement is a bit narrow or the focus is a bit narrow because the requirement only includes uh, emissions from the operations of the local authorities themselves. That is l emissions from the kindergarten, uh, school, uh, offices, whatever it is. But it's not covering the emissions from the uh, from the municipality as a as a geographical region. Uh, region. Mm. Uh, so actually, uh, these climate action plans or climate strategies will only cover a little part of the emissions really taking place on a regional level, because of course the local authorities are, are just a little part of the whole. Mm system, so to speak. Mm. But uh, Environize is actually helping uh, regions to cover the whole area when they start looking into their emissions. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we are looking at, at emissions from the whole area. And we're just following the so-called greenhouse gas protocol for communities. And mm. uh, so, yeah, so mm. it's, it's wider than this, uh, you know, uh, uh, planning process or uh, strategies mm. that are required by law. Mm. And what happens in the regions and municipalities after you have uh, calculated their emissions and footprints? What will be the next step? What happens afterwards? Uh, it's a bit different. Uh, in most cases, uh, included in our work has been not only to calculate the carbon footprint, but also to uh, give some recommendations of what should be the highest prioritized actions. Mm. 
and maybe to be honest, maybe uh, at the, at the first what happens is that the uh, regional uh, actors are a bit shocked because we always, almost always end up with the same results that uh, emissions from land are overwhelming. And in, in rural areas in Iceland, it, it's by far the biggest emission factor. You know, this, this Lulu CF uh, emission from mainly from uh, drained wetlands. Mm -hmm. And in two of the four uh, regions we've been working with, uh, the emissions from re uh, drained wetlands is about 85 to 90 percent of the total emissions of the, of the area. So it's a bit shocking. And, and in some cases, you know, it, it feels a bit overwhelming because you start to believe it doesn't matter if I do something about uh, transport or, or industry or whatever, because it, it will somehow disappear in this big, mm. big uh, land use problem. Mm. And is there something that we can do about the land use problem in, in Iceland? What can the regions do? What are the low hanging fruits? Um, there might be no low hanging fruits really, but uh, to start with, of course, a lot of this uh, drained wetland isn't in use. That is, it's not cultivated for, for us as grassland or to pro produce food or feed. So a lot of it could be re restored and, or, or, and thus cutting the emissions by uh, five or 10% uh, in a short uh, period of time. But then it comes to land owners uh, and it comes to disbeliefs in that this really matters and so on and so forth. Uh, however, the local authorities do have some tools and the first tool to mention, it has been mentioned before today, is just special planning. And by law, they are required to uh, consider revising their spatial, uh, spatial planning uh, after its uh, municipal election. But my recommendation has been, you know, everything is changing. You should revise it now, not consider revising. You should revise it now to include uh, things like wetland preservation and wetland restoration, and also to include to a higher extent than you have been doing before, uh, what kind of business development do we want to see in this area? What kind of mm. businesses will fit into this uh, special plan? Mm. So that's, of course, the f formal, uh, legal, uh, strong document or yeah. tool they have. But So would you say that also some uh, regions or private persons, they are waiting for some incentives to maybe take place and that's why they are not acting now. They are just waiting what's ha going to happen in the next years to come. Yeah, if, you, if you go back to this uh, wetland or drained wetlands thing, uh, mm. then the answer is yes. I think uh, many actors are waiting for some kind of incentive because they don't want to act too early yeah. uh, on their own costs. Uh, and this might be a, a hint or obstacle because if everyone is waiting for someone else to assist them mm. uh, in things that they could start doing themselves right now, it mm. will uh, delay the development. And it, Delay is bad because this has sort of cumulative effects. As if you manage to stop some kind of emission this year, it's much better than stopping it next year or after five years, mm. because you, you gain this profit, so to speak, in terms of less emissions every year from now on, when I mean, you have done it. Mm. So yeah, I think it it's, uh, it's might be one of the problems mm. that, that people or, or companies are waiting uh, mm. for someone to assist them. Mm. It should be noted uh, that uh, in addition to what I said about uh, requirements by law to mm. do this and that, that the National Association of Local Authorities is ast assisting the local authorities to some extent in their climate work mm. uh, related to this uh, legal requirement about having their climate plans ready for the end of the year mm. for their own operations. And the association is assisting the uh, local authorities through, for instance, they have created a platform where uh, people from the local authorities can meet. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, developed a toolkit for them to make it easier to do the uh, carbon footprint calculations and to give examples of uh, action plans that they can pick the best part from. So there is, there is some support uh, mm -hmm. already. 
Could, could you also give us one example uh, of a region in Iceland that's already doing some, uh, some good uh, climate work? Um, is there some, uh, some example that, that you could share that's maybe leading the way in Iceland? Uh, the first region uh, that comes to my mind is basically not a region, but just a town, the town of Akureyri in, in northern Iceland. Uh, they are one of three uh, towns or, or municipalities in Iceland that are members of uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. So they've been, uh, during the last few years, working a lot on climate issues, not only on mitigation plan, but also on, also on adaptation planning, uh, risk assessments, and so on and so forth. They haven't, you know, they are not on the top 10 list in the world, but they are moving forward and they're really setting the example, not only through this work with uh, the Covenant of Mayors, but also by, uh, you know, um, taking a holistic view uh, in exploring uh, better use of resources. They are, for instance, mapping all biological resources in a larger area and, and uh, together with all other municipalities in the region. So this region or two regions in the north might be the, the front runners as it is now, mm. because they are trying to, you know, find ways to, yeah, to uh, get as close to the, uh, you know, circular economy as possible by, by fully utilizing all the resources that this, uh, yeah, has been thrown away in, in bio-waste and so on. Mm. And they're they are looking for different kinds of products and this is about job creation and, and so on. So there's a lot going on north there. Yeah. Let's hope that the other regions in Iceland will, will shortly follow. Um, we have very short time uh, for the Nordic tour today, so I will just uh, end my, my part here and quickly ask if there are um, questions from the audience at this point. Um, and if not, then we will just uh, continue the tour. Thank okay. you, Stefan. Thank you, Iceland, exactly. So, microphone. <laughs> Our next or final stop on today's Nordic tour goes to. Hello and very welcome, Kjetil Björklund. You're the climate expert at KS. Kommunernas samarbetsorgan i, i Norway, the Nordic uh, Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Authorities. Uh, so uh, we gave you the unpleasant spot here of being the last speaker of the day, but uh, last but not least. So um, I thought it was very Im interesting when I started talking to you uh, to also compare with Anna, who's been with us earlier, describing the, the systematic approach in Denmark. But in Norway, you're building on uh, a bottom-up approach that was first developed in Oslo. We're talking about climate budgeting and climate budgets. So, uh, Shetil, please tell us a bit more. Why is this climate budget tool so effective for municipalities? I know you've reached out now and got 170 municipalities in Norway to start using this tool. So tell us, what's, what's the secret with this tool? How is it effective? Uh, at, uh, thank you uh, for inviting us. Uh, at first, I have to congratulate you with your new and first pri female prime minister in Sweden today. Yay! Isn't it great? I hope I'm not the thank you. I, hope, I hope I'm not the first one to address this, but uh, this is a You great are, question. as a matter of fact. It takes uh, a Norwegian <laughs> feminist to the show to get th something started. Thank you. Very good. Uh, and uh, but first, uh, before we go to the climate uh, budget uh, process in Norway, uh, some words about uh, Norway and our situation. We are 356 municipalities and 11 counties in Norway, and all of them were, is working with this topic in different ways, with the transition based on the human resources and natural resources in the areas where they live. Uh, in Norway, as in your countries, most of our local communities are built on those resources and, of course, the knowledge amongst the population, the businesses and the energy and transportation routes between all these local places. 
and the history of all our local communities is based on this. And I think the way to a more sustainable future has to build on the local human and natural resources in all our municipalities. Whether it's big or small amount of emissions uh, that is to be reduced or big or small adaptation challenges in the area. I, I think I have to address this. And before we came to the climate budget, we have, have had several initiatives in Norway to address this topic just transition the last years. One of them is an uh, initiative from KS um, to run R&D project some years ago named uh, Local Quality or Cortres Quality, uh, where we asked uh, some consultants, among them Cicero, Cicero, to find out how our members, municipalities, municipalities and counties should work to achieve a society with low emissions. And first and most important, what they said was uh, they, they came with a strategy and they said transition to a low emission society does not primarily require new knowledge, new regulation or improved technology. Most important for local and regional authorities is to use their identity as democratic actors in order to st stimulate climate innovation processes. And I think this is a is a key to understand why uh, in stu to Journalization through climate budgets has uh, had this way in, in Norway because a lot of our members have, have taken this this into account when 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 they have worked with the with the climate issue uh, the last year and uh, basically you this see a clear leadership leadership here that they want to take a lead and they want to to make a difference here um, how how does this play out and. And I, I assume that the budget tool is effective because it's it's part of the of the budget of the municipality. I mean, you yeah. put you put the climate action in in the center of, of uh, financial or fiscal policy in the municipality, right? Yeah. So so is yeah. is that part of the solution here? Yeah, uh, this uh, report said that um, one should look at the win-win concept, an integrated approach regarding the municipal service land use planning and the investment program, programs, look after local resources and how environmental, social and cultural qualities could form a sustainable basis. Look after and sort the measures in three different levels, efficiency, development and transition measures and work in parallel with this and use the municipalities as catalysts catalyst for transition. And then we come to this uh, this climate budget, which, start, which started in Oslo six years ago. And this is, in fact, easy. Uh, they integrated the climate budget in the ordinary municipal budget. It identified the emission reduction measures, the cost and responsible unit, and reporting as part of the ordinary budget cycle. And that... Um, the purpose here is to show the financial consequences of the measures, the consequences of the budget in a climate context, and the connection between the emission reduction measures and other activities in the budget, and finally to create a relationship between plans and management documents. And that uh, is, uh, in a way, um, it was not the state that demanded that the uh, municipalities should do this. It was the local need because you have politicians that want something and you have uh, administration that want to show something and you have a lot of people down in the organization which are sitting on the measures which are to be put into this uh, climate budget. So uh, there was uh, in fact Oslo that uh, uh, was the first one and uh, they have used their role together with some other municipalities to guide several others and that's uh, that's um, the reason why this has become so successful so you developed a system for peer-to-peer -peer learning here uh, where you also engaged your fylken as far as i understand right the regional actors have also yeah. been important here we have had a support mechanism in Norway called Klimasats, where the environmental agency has used about 1 billion kroner the last five years, uh, supporting local action towards green transition. 
and over 30 network of municipalities and and counties, uh, which has, uh, in fact, used this uh, process to learn from each other and guide guide each other. And and what have you seen so far in terms of impact? And could you give some concrete examples of of, uh, of changes of municipalities that really uh, managed, like Lahti that we heard a lot about today here, uh, to really cut their CO2 emissions? Yeah, uh, Oslo what about Oslo six years yeah. down the line? Yeah, Oslo is one of the examples. We see that the municipalities which use uh, use uh, uh, this, uh, they they uh, they, they find be better ways to to address the the the, the targets and uh, which measures are to be filling the gap. But of course, uh, uh, it goes slower than we could hope. But uh, a lot of these uh, municipalities decreases their emissions. I, I guess it's also a matter of, uh, of, of how much you can do as, at the local level and what needs to happen at the national level. And of course, in, in, in Norway, it's the big debate about the fossil, fossil production as well and, and, and the, the, the grand scale of, of uh, carbon footprint in that sense. But how, how, how does that play out, the, the, the relationship here, the dialogue between the local and, and the national level, you, you think? Uh, is, is the budget helping also here to, to show the figures and and be able to to, to uh, create more pressure. Yeah, but uh, there's of course some problems. There's some key limitations, and that's uh, how good the national statistics are. Um, there's of course also a discussion in Norway about consumption-based emissions uh, and uh, uh, in in the budget process. And we have have this discussion also in Norway about emissions from land use, which is 3.4 million tons in Norway and, and increasing. And there are several projects running against better tool, example for for area accounts. And then we also have this discussion about the wind power um, uh, installation, uh, which uh, which which uh, is has uh, until now has been run through the through the Energy Act and not to the uh, to the Building and Planning Act. And we got an uh, we got an answer from the parliament um, this spring that uh, this uh, this um, wind power uh, plants should come back to the planning and building act so that the area disposal should be done in the in the municipalities so we have the same discussions so, as as you in your countries yeah, I was just going to ask how you how you were facing the, the the land use conflicts here and the emerging resource conflicts as well. If you wanted to give an example, is, is that something where where Oslo is also leading because of their long term work with this, or is is there any other municipality you'd like to highlight who's working in an interesting way with the land use issues? We have several uh, municipalities which now are working to to put their uh, area plans. Uh, into uh, uh, climate neutrality for the for the land use. Uh, as an example, we have this. Uh, we have some municipalities which are focusing on areal uh, uh, neutrality. Uh, amongst them, Lofoten in the north of Norway, which has uh, made a strategy. Uh, so there's, uh, but uh, there's a lack of uh, accounting tools, and there's uh, a lot of work going on to to find better tools for for accounting. And, and you're also working hard, I, I believe, to, to include the rural uh, municipalities in, in your uh, planning here in, in, in the, using the, the climate budgets. I don't know if you wanted to comment on any differences here with the, the urban and rural regions. You could say this is an ideological uh, question in a way. We say in, the, in, KS, uh, in KOAS uh, when we have a planning and building act which is uh, made for all municipalities and counties, uh, there's, uh, there's, that's the answer that uh, that everyone shall uh, shall be a part of this uh, this work, whether it's small or big uh, measures. Uh, so uh, so we are working hard to to have the small municipalities as a part of this. But the way through that goes to a, a big a bigger municipality in the neighborhood, which can uh, be a part of the guidance. It's collaboration again. That's the key collaboration between the municipalities. I don't know if we had any questions in the audience uh, to the Norwegian perspective here. 
Uh, you're very welcome before we wrap up. We have any comments in the chat? Anyone else wants to say anything? Everything is crisp clear. How do you see, Shatil, final question uh, regarding Nordic collaboration? I know that you're also interested in that aspect. What do you think, what would you like to learn from other Nordic municipalities? Or rather, how do you think the climate budget uh, tool could, could work f uh, outside of, of Norway? Uh, when I'm at my farm in Sweden, I see there's a lot of similarities between our countries. And I think we mainly should uh, col collaborate more, but uh, uh, a part of the daily work is that uh, we use a lot of energy to, to help our municipalities and uh, we have we seldom have time to, to use uh, time to, uh, on other countries and, and the collaboration and that's a problem, of course. So we should all step up a little bit to, to learn from each other. And of course, Nordregio hopes to be able to facilitate more of that learning also moving forward and, and the continuous focus on climate. Thank you so much, Shetil, for joining us today. And uh, thank you, all of you uh, listening in today online and also here in the audience. So it's time for our uh, final wrap up for the day. So very welcome, Rolf Elmer, um, our director here at Noregio. What did you learn today, Rolf? I learned actually that um, I'm very grateful that we made this a hybrid event because just today Finland uh, increased our regulations on wearing face masks. So that's why we have seen everybody here in the audience having face masks. So that's really good that we made it a hybrid event so so many could participate. But uh, the impressions from today is that um, uh, thinking about the, what Paula Le Leftemaki told us uh, about the change in appearance and her impressions from COP26 is that uh, it went from discussions, consensus building, negotiations, to actually be very much action-oriented. And what we are seeing today is that action is happening on all levels of government and also in all uh, different sectors. Uh, we heard from Lahti that um, they are actually being a front-runner, having um, struggling now to keep up uh, with the business side, with other actors in the society. I think that's very good that everybody's pulling in the right direction uh, together uh, would make this uh, more uh, quicker uh, changes and more um, reasonable changes. And also very interesting to hear from uh, Joan Kunohana about this, uh, the need of a systemic view of a policy formation, uh, that we can't just focus on climate policies or fiscal policies, we have to have a, a complete picture of what is needed. And I think that's very hopeful for us at Norwegian because in our different projects that we are doing right now, we're actually addressing all of these aspects in policy formation. So I think there will be very good and interesting results coming out from Norwegian the coming year. So I, I will get to back to you next year, uh, and you're all welcome to come to Norwegian and to the Norwegian Forum next year. So thank you very much. And, and what that brings you hope in terms of further Nordic collaboration on this issue? I think we have heard today that uh, actually the, the examples uh, from the different part on the Nordics um, really shows us that we can le learn from each other and as we heard from Kynukvarna, the Nordics uh, are a very, very, very well developed, very well states uh, and we can re really take a lead and we can make a change uh, to the better be by being uh, front runners uh, around the world actually. So um, I think it's very interesting to hear about these different aspects and also this consumption-based emission, um, how can we incorporate that in our climate policies, in our different systemic perspectives, perspectives on, on the policy formation? I think that's very important and a st large step in the coming years <laughs> to bring things to, to policy. For sure, and as a matter of fact, Nordic Council of Ministers uh, recently initiated a new, new program on, on uh, those consumption-based or lifestyle-based uh, 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 climate uh, climate emissions as well. So we'll see how that, that also moves forward. Well, thank you so much, Rolf. And again, thank you everyone for participating today. Uh, we will uh, uh, wrap up also and send everyone who signed up uh, an email beginning of next week so you can see recordings of, of the event and also of course, get the presentations if we, if it's permitted, uh, from all our speakers and and also links to further readings and reports. And and we will keep in touch. We'll come back 
to this issue for sure, because it's definitely one of the core issues for the Nordic vision of being the most sustainable region by 2030 and also for our global commitment to Agenda 2030. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.